So uh, the title is When Life Gets in the Way, Non-Idealized Paths of Virtuous Development. So Aristotle is lurking throughout this whole presentation with his more idealized notions. In particular, the ones I'm interested in non-idealizing is the idea that you're supposed to flourish while being virtuous and that uh, you're supposed to take pleasure. And it doesn't count as a virtue for Aristotle unless you take pleasure in the virtue. Somehow you're thriving in all sorts of ways being virtuous. And I want to challenge that and still count it as virtuous. So main questions. How do motives, life goals, and virtues shape the development of the self? That should be no surprise. How does one's gender and social ecology both foster and constrain that development? So we're particularly interested in the social ecology tied to gender, but also family. We, we're working on what family influences there are in one's development. And how do difficult circumstances both thwart and facilitate virtues? And how should they give a non-idealized context? So those are the kinds of questions we're asking. We're focusing on life stories. This is basically Jack's life work. He's a narrative psychologist, collects stories of all sorts for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and for this, he's working with me. And for the first time, thinking about gender in his stories. He's never thought about that before. So that's fun for him, I assume. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he says, Peggy, this is fun. He, well, he's a very enthusiastic guy. so. So the view is that we construct ourselves in story form, and our life stories reveal our values and virtues that motivate us. So motives, values, and virtues as narrative themes, we'll be looking for those in these life stories and coding for them and so on. Um, multiple themes that we code for within the same thought event, and I'll talk more about thought events. Thought events in lived context, part of self-identity. And life stories draw from cultural master narratives. Sometimes people don't realize they're drawing from them, of course, but they are. Uh, so themes there reflect cultural values, virtues, and ideals. And our approach allows for both a quantitative and qualitative critical analysis. Uh, we haven't really started the quantitative part yet. We've done 100 interviews and a lot of transcribing of these interviews and listening to selected ones, but we haven't done the qualitative, I mean the quantitative part yet. So method and participants and procedure, it's, as I said, it's part of a larger project at University of Dayton, a longitudinal study of adult life and transitions. It's a little deceptive because it's adult life of UD grads. <laughs> University of Dayton graduates, which, which fortunately gives you both genders, to think about, but not necessarily other subgroups of various <laughs> interest. Okay, so in, our, in this particular study, it's a two-year standalone study with a longer-term analysis. We're, we're going to be using this data for years to think about various questions that we have. So the first year was life story interviews and a survey. So we had 100 participants, and we have completed these interviews, ages 20 to 80s. 60% women, 63% Catholic, 75% married or committed, and $100,000 a year average income. So this is not your lower economic status group, and politically moderate for the most part. Not always. So there are two to three hour Skype interviews that are transcribed in a one hour online survey. In my case, I don't see the people. So if Jack is interviewing or the graduate students are interviewing, they see them on Skype. But what I do is Jack will select some he thinks will be a special interest to me, and I put on earphones and I listen to the interview, which I find really interesting. I don't see them, but I hear a lot from the tone, and the, whether they're lighthearted or sort of laughing at themselves or very intense or angry, and I was, I've been thinking a lot about the justice. People definitely get angry when they're talking about injustices that have occurred to them or others. Uh, so I really enjoy that, but not knowing what they look like. So year two, we'll be doing the family story interviews and survey. We've developed our survey questions and interview questions and uh, are getting started on that right now. And those are going to be 50 of them with two to three family members identified by the persons we interviewed. And it's, it's amazing to me. We'll, we'll spend three hours with someone. They'll make the time. They're really busy people. 
they'll make the time for a three-hour interview, and they say, and then we ask, oh, by the way, are you willing to be interviewed again as a family member, as part of a family, and if so, who would you want us to interview? And they're like, oh, sure. <laughs> it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, they are self-selected. I mean, they agreed to, to do this, so that's another difficulty in, in extrapolating more generally about people. Um, so they're transcribed in the one-hour survey as well for the family stories. So the interview questions include life chapters. So we say, tell us about the main chapters in your life. Think of your life as book with chapters. Give them titles. Describe each chapter briefly. Sometimes, and we say, keep this whole thing to 15 minutes, and sometimes two hours later, they're still telling us their chapters. <laughs> Key scenes in the life story. And this includes high point in your life, low point, and I should mention here many tears. I know, I cry when I'm listening, I laugh when I'm listening. Turning point in their life, major life decisions, including work and relationship decisions, insight or realization event, gender event, challenges in life, greatest life challenge, greatest interpersonal loss, and once again, tears, gender-based life challenge, not everybody knows they have one, social justice challenge, personal values and beliefs, include role model, religion and spirituality, which I just find really interesting as a non-religious person to listen to all these, I was thinking of your two presentations, um, all these very devoted, very church-oriented people. It's been good for me. Political and social views, personal development, becoming yourself while growing up. So we ask, what, when did you transition from basically being represented by your family's values to your own, if you ever did. Personal weaknesses and vices, personal strengths and virtues. And I will say about the personal weaknesses and vices, how many of these super accomplished women, it's weight. It's like, really? Uh, personal growth project, overarching aim or theme in life. And this is what sort of ties everything together. What, do we, what is your overarching goal in life or theme in life that you've been trying to accomplish. And the two I'm talking about today are in their later years, so 60s and late 40s. I'm sorry if you're in your late 40s and I called that later years. <laughs> Gender event. So just to give you an example of a more specific and lengthy description of our question, please describe a specific event in which your identification as a woman or man shaped how the event unfolded. As with the questions earlier, this event should have taken place on a specific day in a specific place. In this event, perhaps gender roles and expectations shaped your own action or decisions in this event, or perhaps your identification as a woman or man shaped the actions or decisions of the people around you. And here's the one other sample interview question. Uh, have you experienced a challenge or problem that is related to the idea of social justice? Perhaps you experienced or witnessed some kind of prejudice, discrimination, or other form of injustice. This might have taken place in your workplace, in your community, or even with your family or friends. Please describe what this challenge or problem is, how it emerged, who was involved, how you have addressed or dealt with it, and what it might say about you or your life. So now we're going to focus on the life stories of Sharon and Lena. Not their real names, of course. Um, and we picked them, well, Jack and I picked them together because we found that they had the kind of aim or theme that was really quite virtuous. Both of them had very similar themes. And we were looking for people that were focused on virtue both in their interpersonal relations and in their societal interactions and transformations, trying to make the world a better place or society a better place and trying to improve their intimate or close family relations. We wanted people with combinations. And Sharon and Lena definitely had these goals, but they also had life experiences that show that they followed through in these goals as best as they could throughout their lives so far. So Sharon <coughs> said her overarching aim or theme was to help people, which many women and men have as their overarching, you know, make a difference or help people is a big. So she started with kids and not her own kids, but other kids in the community, and today she wants to help her family members. And Lena said, to do right by others, I want to try to improve the human condition and create a more civil society, which is exactly what we were looking for, someone wanting to do that. 
So we'll start with life chapters for Sharon. She was 60 years old at the time of the interview. Um, both Sharon and Lena have similar childhoods. They were in the Midwest. They had large Catholic families. They were in nice, nice neighborhoods. Um, in chapter two for Sharon, she moved to another Midwest city. She went to a Catholic grade school, then public high school. Many of our interviewees went to Catholic schools. Uh, and of course, they went to UD. So she went to college. That was her chapter three. She called this very formative, had good friendships, majored in psychology. And I will mention here that this is where I already started to get sad listening to this. She goes, the highlight of her life was college. And she's 60 years old. Uh, chapter four, job and social service sector. She worked with juveniles. That's the kids that she's talking about. But she burnt out after 10 years and also faced a series of difficult family events, which we'll talk about later. Chapter five, she worked in legal services, which she really liked and relocated to do it. Also, at this point in her life, she got hearing aids at age 40, even though she'd had hearing problems her entire life. So she'd been dealing with difficulties hearing and uh, didn't really address it till age 40. Chapter six, 20 years, starting at age 40, caring for her older sister. We'll talk more about that. Her sister has a degenerative neurological disease. It's genetic and runs in the family. I mentioned her briefly in our last presentation, but we're going to delve more deeply into this situation. Uh, her virtue is patience, even though I don't view myself as patient, which I think is, would be interesting to come back to whether that's a virtue. Uh, vice, I can be loud, tied to hearing problem, and pushy, tied to pushing for things to be done in the family. So she calls that a vice. Greatest life challenge, dealing with mental illness in the family. Lena, late 40s at time of interview, Chapter one, Midwest, friendly neighborhood, idyllic. Chapter two, tumultuous years, religious wars, brother violent with father. So this brother was a basically turned fundamentalist sort of religion in a Catholic family and rejected the Catholic church to the degree he wouldn't even go to her wedding because it was in a Catholic church. So, and he was just very self-righteous and violent with her father. This was very traumatic for her. So she kind of withdrew during those years. Chapter three, college, UD, involved in campus activities, volunteered in orphanages abroad. And she said this had a big impact on her seeing those in these orphanages. It was in Central America, I believe, that she went. Um, and she majored in social work. Chapter four, graduate school, master's in social work, met her future husband. Chapter five, two children's childhood. And here, during these two children's childhood, she, she cut back on work some, but meanwhile, she also had this successful coup at work to save a child welfare program. When she described what she accomplished, I mean, she was a high-powered job, first in D.C., but eventually at a smaller non-for-profit on child welfare. Um, she was basically told, you have to fire everyone in your group. Your job is to fire everyone, and she figured out how to keep, not only keep them all hired, but, but relocated in, in a whole different place and do it all surreptitiously without the boss knowing. I mean, it was just an incredible story of what she's able to do. Um, she's also an advocate for her teenage children, described going to the teachers when her children were mistreated and what she did. And then she also, in spite of how very busy her life is, would help marginalized students at her kids' high school prepare for college essays because she saw somebody needed to do that. And as she says, virtue, I'm an advocate for the marginalized. And uh, I, I want to say from my perspective, being an advocate is an interesting virtue. And I'm wondering if it's more tied to women than men, it's, it's especially tied to children's advocates. Uh, vice, stubbornness, greatest life challenge, having a successful marriage. So, so notice that Sharon never married. Um, she did have some relationships early on, but she didn't marry and didn't have children. So first, let's talk, talk about gender and this gender event. I already mentioned what we asked about that, but then we also asked about gender-based life challenge. So think about the single greatest challenge or problem that you have faced that is tied to being a woman or man. Perhaps other people have treated you unfairly or differently on account of being a woman or man. Perhaps you have felt pressure to live up to the ideal image of being a woman or man. In any case, please describe what this challenge or problem is, how the challenge or problem developed, who was involved, how you have addressed or dealt with it, and what it might say about you or your life. 
Now notice every question we asked at the end, what it might say about you or your life, they would always forget to add that part. And sometimes we would prompt them. So what does that say? Sometimes we'd, we'd move on. So Sharon's gender event. And notice they could just pick anything. And Sharon picked her first menstruation. So she grew up a devout Catholic. And when she started menstruating, she had no idea what was happening. And she thought she was dying. Learned from her mother that this was going to happen every month. Very traumatic. And then she worried that it was a sin and felt sinful. And then from then on, she maintained more distance from boys and she was no longer a tomboy after that. So it was a very significant event for her. Um, her gender-based life challenge, she didn't really talk about a life challenge. She once again sort of talked about a particular event, which is interesting because there's a lot of gender in all of her life challenges that she didn't see. but. Um, so she picked her attempt to help a young, age 13, pregnant girl while she was working with juveniles. And the county social services would not pay for the abortion. She tried everything she could to figure out how to help this young girl. She said, what? You can't let a child have a baby. And then she said, eye-opening case for me about the limits of what the system can do. Lena's gender event. When 12, she challenged the view that only men could be ushers in church. She went to the priest, she set off a huge firestorm. She's 12, set off a huge firestorm. She feels for her dad to this day navigating all these old stodgy white men <laughs> and managed to become an usher at 14. So she challenged the system and got to be an usher at 14. Uh, and she, the meaning for this was, the meaning behind it is that I have always fought for women's rights, always looked for injustice. So this is the kind of person we were looking for uh, as thinking about someone that does that. Her life challenge was, was a little more long term and it was tied to pay discrimination. I have done the same job as men have done. I in fact today just turned in my dossier, my section chair is trying to get me promoted early because he thinks I have deserved it and earned it and I have publications and I'm teaching and everything, right? Only to find out just a couple hours ago that yeah, they don't, the university at which she works, doesn't really think I'm quite there yet. And I kind of sat there and I thought, I wonder if I was a man. I wonder if I was a man with that resume. I have set, listen to this, I have 70 publications. I have 15 million in grants just in the last seven years. I've given keynotes all over the world. I just sat there and thought, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so she, she has more to say. And as I say, some people just have nothing to say about this because they haven't really thought about gender issues, but she has. There was that twinge in me that thought, because I've seen it around here, I've seen how particularly white men and I consider myself privileged as a white female in comparison to others, but how white men, they do what they want. Their ideas could be the stupidest <laughs> idea ever. And everyone's like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go with that. <laughs> and then she says, I've been thinking a lot about Hillary Clinton. So this was last summer we were interviewing her. Hillary had not yet lost. Um, because people are like, well, she's just harsh. And then I'm like, yeah, but if she was soft, you'd say she's a soft woman. She can't win because you call her a bitch otherwise, or she's, you know, she's either a bitch or she's too soft. So she's like somewhere, trying to be somewhere in the middle, and she can't win. And I think that actually exemplifies how a lot of women feel in this career. You have to tread in a different way than my male counterparts have had to. Now, I think this particular kind of gender-based life challenge comes especially for women that are in mostly male-dominated careers or high-powered careers. There are other women that said they had no problem because they basically just worked with other women. So we had a, a woman who was a, a doula for, for women at, on, on Native American reservations and has always worked with other women, with them and for them, and just never feels this. So it can really vary by what kind of profession someone has gone into and how much they're able to analyze it. So gender, it's not always salient to subjects, as I mentioned. So for instance, Sharon had a restraining order against one of her partners. She, she, as I said, she never married, but she did have a restraining order when he started being abusive. And that wasn't even a major event. She didn't tie that to gender or anything, but she had to leave town for safety. Another woman who said really doesn't have any issues with gender said, 
something about how, but there was that time that this incompetent male boss was hired instead of her when she was by far more competent. And you're like, that's not a gender event? We don't say that, we just listen. Um, and then some would say, in thinking about a gender-based life challenge, you're making me think. Um, probably what showed up most when people were talking about gender was shared parenting inequities. So many of the women, of course, that we talked to were working while raising family, as were their spouses. So when both parents are working, women tend to be, and the ones we've talked to, more focused on and stressed about child rearing details and day-to-day -day needs of children. Um, they would mention things like, you know, who's going to do all the details of scheduling doctor's appointments and making sure <laughs> that they're ready for school, all these things that you just have to do because your partner isn't doing them, and yet you're both working equally as hard uh, on a job. Women are more likely to take on aging parent issues and care, and this showed up a lot. A lot of women had to interrupt, speaking of projects, Valerie, Valerie's talking, Valerie. <laughs> Speaking of projects, many women have to interrupt very valued projects for making the world a better place because they have to go help an aging parent. One was just starting graduate school, got a call that her mother needed help, dropped out of graduate school, goes and stays with her mother for a couple of years. Gender and virtue. So development of virtue is tied to caregiving and nurturing of life partners, children, aging parents, disabled and dependent family members, students and advisees are going to happen by default if that's what you're doing or else they don't and you're not a very good parent. Um, but Sharon said she developed patience even though she doesn't view herself as patient from caring for her sister with dementia. Um, and there's also degrees of awareness of virtues as gendered and the conflicts that arise from this. So Lena said, I struggle both with being strong and male-like at work and with being a mom and caregiver at the same time. Women are expected to be both, but men are just men who are strong. What do others want from me, strength or softness? And remember she mentioned earlier that Hillary couldn't win with the uh, being soft or being strong. And in Marilyn Fry's terms, that's a sign of oppression when you have double binds, they're called double binds, you just can't win whatever you do. And uh, so we saw that quite a bit as well. <coughs> Gender, virtue, and anger I did mention in our last uh, presentation. So Aristotle on anger is mildness is the mean concerned with anger, angry at the right things in the right way at the right time for the right length of time. Excesses include quick-tempered, more angry than is called for, bitter, retaliatory, striking someone in anger. So then my question is, what's the role for anger in caregiving? A danger in expressing anger in personal relationships. Uh, if you have an abusive husband, you don't get to be the angry one. Right. Cultural resistance to women expressing anger at work and in the public sphere. Unchosen virtue of mildness in women. Unchosen virtue of nameless deficiency of anger. Oh, vice, sorry. Unchosen vice of nameless deficiency of anger. Uh, and then we found a range, as I say, on the, what, the degree to which women would get angry about social injustice. So one woman says, I don't talk about politics and I tend not to debate people at work or at family gatherings. It's not my job to convince others that the way I do things is the right way. I was raised Catholic and never lost faith, never stopped going to church, never stopped believing, even though I don't agree with everything the church does. Versus Sharon, who said, I was raised in a devout Catholic family of nine children and was critical as a teenager over women's issues. So she too was critical, along with Lena. The abuse in the Catholic Church really turned me off for good. I'm still, in, this is right, I'm still very angry, especially about the cover-up. I knew a man who was mentally challenged, who was abused by a priest and died from AIDS. I am no longer a Catholic. So you get these two ranges of responses to injustice. Sharon's greatest life challenge as I mentioned, is the older sister with dementia. This older sister was Sharon's role model. She was very intelligent, had a master's. She always thought of her sister as, as a better person, more intelligent than her. Um, and she's the one that in her 30s started developing this early onset dementia. Uh, and so for the past 20 years, she's been taking care of this sister. And it's the biggest chapter of her life and the biggest heartache in her life. 
So for years now, her sister had been functioning at a one-year-old level. And we had been talking to her for close to three hours, and she said, you know, I'm going to have to cut this off and wake my sister up from her nap. Um, mostly mute, the sister, but she does love music. So a lot of what happens for women as caregivers is you are caring for someone, but it's not a reciprocal relationship. You're not, you're not getting much back, certainly, from that person, maybe not even an acknowledgment of who you are in this case. Um, but they do have these moments where they get to play the Beatles, I guess. Um, and then she says, to look at getting married and having kids, it was not going to happen for me. So showing her social justice side, however, Sharon, when she earlier, before she was taking care of her sister, moved to a new state with brown water coming out of the taps. She and another woman got involved together standing outside post offices in the area to get petitions signed. After a year of Saturdays getting these letters signed, we had 3,000 letters that we were sending to the governor. After five years, I ended up with clean water by making that a state park at the water source. That was one of my biggest accomplishments of my life. I was also listening to all these various people's lives. I felt very inadequate, I'll just tell you. They <laughs> <laughs> there are people who are raising children, had really demanding jobs, and they go, oh yes, and of course on Friday night I volunteer for the suicide hotline. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> there are a lot of good people out there. All right, Lena's great, greatest life challenge was her marriage. I did not appreciate the difficulties of having a cross-cultural marriage. And, What's interesting to me about the marriage is it looks like you get to choose your partner. So that, that's something that's a, a choice. But you don't really know who you're getting. I don't know if any of you have noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it turns out she did not appreciate, he was Mexican-American, she just didn't appreciate the cross-cultural aspects and the difficulties that would come from that. And also, he had had a lot of traumatic events in his life, and it's shaped him more than she'd ever realized. Her biggest struggle, struggle is navigating that relationship in a way that's authentic, in a way that's healthy. And it, ter it turns out it leads to a lot of trauma. For instance, with her mother, her mother is a difficult woman who says things that probably she shouldn't say. She's just very direct and sometimes critical. And he just cannot handle this from the mother, and they do not get along. And this has just been her greatest heartbreak, is the relationship between her husband and her mother. Um, her biggest struggle is navigating that relationship in a way that's authentic and in a way that's healthy. So life is a balancing act. It's a great theme of SMV and midlife stories. This is one of Jack's main sort of stresses in his writings of various sorts, that much of what we're doing in life is trying to balance that's true for all of us. Um, as Lena says, I've always had a hard time balancing work and family. I always have. It's been a point of difficulty in my marriage. That's the truth. It's so hard to be a two-parent working family. Lack of luck. So going back to Aristotle, eudaimonia rests on leisure and luck. And those of you that know Jack, uh, know that he basically works in well-being and eudaimonia studies. I'm the virtue person, so we've been trying to combine the, the virtue and the eudaimonia uh, interests. So luck, according to Aristotle, involves, well, according to Aristotle and us, health. He didn't say socioeconomic status, but uh, genetic lottery, nor did he say that, and life's ups and downs. But according to Aristotle, any of these things, including bad children or any of these things, can cause you to not have a virtuous or good life. So living out one's passions or engaging in meaningful projects could happen, but luck could get bad and life gets in the way and you don't get to do that. So for Sharon, of course, sharing, caring for her sister with dementia for 20 years meant that the activism that really made her feel good and proud of herself and the biggest accomplishment of her life happened before she was 40, and now she's unable to focus her activities on social justice issues. And I find that's a little bit deceiving because although she's mostly focused on her family with these genetic issues and what to do about her various deteriorating family members, um, she did say, as sort of an aside, 
I made this video to help other families with these kinds of problems and, and uh, how to navigate the system. So she's still doing stuff, she just doesn't quite view it that way. Lena, of course, underestimated issues tied to spouse choice. So this is another Jack theory. So he talks about the roller coaster of redemption, contamination, and redemption. So you go up, down, up, down. Tragedies come in redemptive sequences. So for example, boyfriend cheats. This led to a career change. Turns out it was a blessing in disguise. And, and commonly we, we hear that phrase, some, some setback, something preventing you from moving forward the way you thought you were going to but it turns out it was a blessing in disguise. Many of us make our life narratives that way. I do it, I don't know if the rest of you do. I couldn't get in ornithology, so I had to take computer science, and then I got a master's in computer science. Who knew I would like it? You know, that sort of story that I happen to have in my life. It was a blessing in disguise. Followed by contamination again, so she, this is actually Sharon, here as well, new career, she loved it, it was interesting and exciting, and then stopped for her sister. So you get these up, down, up, down. So with many of these participants, you have a perceived integrity, but not a perceived self-actualizing. And in analyzing Lena and Sharon, we think of uh, Sharon as really not self-actualizing. She, she doesn't feel like she did and didn't get a chance to. And Lena does feel that she did and is quite pleased with the progress of her life. So virtuous action and self-actualizing are sometimes in conflict. Life gets in the way. And here's some examples from other life stories. And once again, boy, the tears that we got to, I got to listen to. A woman who was raped and decided on an abortion. She's very Catholic, very devoted Catholic. Um, single, and this, this guy that raped her, when she told him she was going to have an abortion, he, he then threatened to tell the Catholic, her Catholic people and her parents, he called her parents in the middle of the night. It's, I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, talked to a man who was dying of cancer in his 40s, and once again thinking about projects, not so many projects with goals in mind, more like the project of surviving and enjoying every day. And he was, he was willing to talk to us, and it was hard for him to talk. He was coughing, he was needing to take drinks of water, but he wanted to share his story. Um, a number, of course, of miscarriages, very devastating to people. One had a son who was diagnosed as a psychopath, speaking of bad children, right? And that's just hard for you. You can't, you can't overcome that. You can't just say, oh, my life's fine. My son's a psychopath, he's in jail, no big deal. Abusive spouses, parents needing end of life care is a big one. And a lot of times the low points that, of people in their 60s that we're talking to was their fathers dying and never really recovering. They say, never really recovered from that. Um, one had a daughter diagnosed with MS and he, he just was this really strong guy and he, he was going along fine until he talked about this and he started crying. So, final slide, oh look at this, 941, I'm doing so well. When life gets in the way, unchosen virtue. Just wanna end on this quote, again from Sharon. My virtue is patience, even though I don't view myself as patient, you have to do what you have to do. I'm not going to put my sister in a home. And I'd be interested to discuss with you, I was listening to Sharon and I'm going like, I would've put my sister in a home. <laughs> so I'd be interested if you think she did the virtuous thing because she's given up, I would argue, too much but I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. So thank you. So Peggy, this is really fascinating work. What is the larger take home message for the participants in this project? So, you know, now you have the chance to just tell us what it is that your, what your message is with all this work? What, what, have, what can we learn? What do you want us to learn? Well, my message in general with my philosophy 
is non-idealized approaches, like looking at actual lives and seeing what it takes to be virtuous in actual lives and what prevents that, but also can we redefine virtue in a way that accommodates more, more. So let's not hope for the flourishing and the virtue necessarily, which is always the goal for Aristotelians, um, and figure out how to help people do more coping virtues, I think. Yes. Yeah, is this on? Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. This was so interesting. It was a really interesting way to start the morning. And I'm just um, struck by the stories that you share. They, they make me think of what people like Claudia Card and Lisa Tessman are calling, especially with respect to things like gender, um, character formation under conditions of bad constitutive moral luck, which is, yes. is you know, it's, that's the yeah, right. And so I'm just wondering if, if it would be, and if you've thought about connecting your questions about especially gender to some of their thinking about burden virtues and about what character traits are virtues under those conditions, and they might look really different. They might be right. burdened in certain sorts of ways. That's what struck me. Right, and in my other writings, I do a lot yeah. more testament. Yeah. She's one of my faves. Right, yeah, so um, just linking that with what you're doing here. Right, so. burden virtues. I was thinking about extending it to burden lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so under those lives, what Because are I don't know that I want to call the virtues burdened. Yeah, I, I want to call the lives <laughs> burdened, and then what virtues come out of burden lives? Mm -hmm and still call them all-out virtues. I, th I think these two women are awe-inspiring. Yeah. Awe-inspiring, extremely virtuous women. I might have made different choices, but there's a lot of uh, suffering and difficulty in following through on your projects. And that's why my concern about projects was, was brought up with, with you all. I, I just, it was just so sad to hear about, you know, I was on my way, I was gonna get my master's, I was gonna help children, and then I had to go take care of my mother. And then often the mother's difficult, right? You go and take care of the mother, and she's one of these completely negative mothers that you don't wanna be around, is never grateful for anything. I kinda have one of those, actually, that I take care of. <laughs> Sweet, she's a sweetie, but she's like the most negative, anxious person you'd ever meet. And you, you can't not absorb that, so you just like, I, I need to be a, a joyful caretaker of my mother, but it's very hard. You just find yourself being impatient and then getting mad at yourself that you're impatient. It's just very hard. Yeah, I, oh, I wanted to uh, um, just say again, uh, thanks for this. This is the, the attention to the uh, context of the relationships in which these people are, the, the detail of their lives. It's, uh, it's inspiring, uh, mm -hmm. so thank you. And I was wondering specifically about the roller coaster. And I, I don't know if you've talked uh, with Jack in, in some, at some length about the roller coaster. I, I was haven't, that's why I wish you were here. Okay, well maybe I'll just ask you to, to um, just respond from you know, whatever your, uh, your own work shows. Um, I was curious about the term redemption and contamination. Yeah, what, what I is, am too. <laughs> what is, so what, in your sense, is that consonant with anything that you see in your um, work in, and your, your emphasis on kind of uh, life getting in the way? What is, what is the contamination a contamination of? What is clean? And yeah, I know. I, you know, I would not pick those words. Okay. Maybe I need to argue with Jack. Okay. <laughs> All right. And That's a good point. Wh what about the redemption Contamination side? is just not my word. Okay. What about the redemption side? Is, do you have a sense of what, uh, what is doing the redeeming in the life uh, that gets in the way? What, well, what you do is you have some horrible thing happen in your life, and you're looking back on your life story, and you think, but something good came out of it. This, I never would have found, met so-and-so, or I never would have ended up being in computer science, all right, you know? And uh, so I would word it differently, but you take a negative and maybe even devastating event in your life that feels like you have failed in some way or suffered in some horrible way, and you then say, but there's redem redemption in the fact that something good came out of it for me and for my growth. So, I mean, it's self-improvement, but also just more generally something, something good came out of it. I would, I would, 
You know, I thank you. I need to, I need to w talk to Jack about this part. Lou? Oh uh, yeah, that was uh, just. Are you? I'm over here. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. My eyesight is it's not that good. It's a voice coming from the speaker somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was so absorbing. I mean, it's one of the most in, uh, interesting presentations I've seen of, of life story work. So. Yeah. Oh, good. So thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask you about that that statement that you said. This is what we're looking for, and I think it was something like, "I want to." My overarching goal in my life is to make a difference in. Uh, you know, make the world a better place, something like that. Help people. Help people. In these two women's cases. And so I, 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 was, I had three questions related to that. First is, did you have some way of, so I might have missed this, you might have said this, but did you have some way of selecting for those people in particular? And then the second question is, uh, how many of these interviews had statements like that in them? Like what portion is it, roughly? Right. I mean, you know, I, I can't, you know, obviously there's no exact number at this point, but maybe rough portion. And then third, did you notice that it, is there a way that people are just saying that, or does it really, when they say that, does it really evident in their life stories that that's what they did? Well, not always, but this, these two, don't you think it's pretty evident? Clearly, yes. Yeah, yeah. that's why we picked these two. So yeah. we picked these two because I thought they were a good combination of follow through with what they say about their lives and what they've done with their lives as best they could in light of their difficult circumstances. Um, I would have to, we'd have to go back and quantify. We're just starting on the quantifying of various stories. And we know that half, what did I say? I, the one thing we've looked at is how many thought there was some sort of relevant gender event and it was only half or something. <coughs> I, I have that earlier in the slide. Um, but no, there's, there's a high percentage of people who say they want to help. And I'm wondering to what degree that's Catholic. You know, UD is, all, I think we're ranked as, up there with other Catholic schools, but maybe the highest on service orientation. We, we work with our students on service and do a lot of abroads. Jack's on one of them now, but um, also just service in the Dayton community. We were one of the most tied to our community of any university that I know of. We win awards for this. And uh, so you get that developed and then they, they continue with it. But I found this in a lot of people raised as Catholic, whether they're still Catholic or not. Uh, they seem to have a service and working for others orientation, so I would worry that we're skewed a little bit because of the Catholic background. Not to say that other backgrounds aren't <laughs> service oriented, I am not Catholic, um, but uh, I, those are good questions to ask and we'll be doing that definitely. I do know that Jack has found in previous work that if people are doing the same exact thing but for different motives, like they're running a company and one is to make a difference in the world or to help others with this company and the other is to make money, those that are making a difference are happier, self-reported happier. And can I just follow up, you said a high percentage, that, would you, you know, I, I know you're just going on rough intuitions at this point, but is that like more than half, would you say, or less than half, or? You know? Yeah, I haven't looked at all of them to know, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. I think it was more prevalent in the women, but awful lot of very spiritual, very or service-oriented men that we mm -hmm. talked to. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the, again, uh, powerful presentation. Um, you mentioned about that, uh, the, you know, the family deaths, uh, family members' death is a profound impact on the human, you know, the person's life. Was it? Just one person you, you talk, mentioned about death. Uh, de I mean, the per a person's uh, dad's death. Dad's death? Yeah, yeah. No, there are a number of, of women, who said usually that women, that said mm -hmm. the, the most traumatic thing was their dad's dying. Yeah. Usually because dads die sooner and many of them, their mothers were still alive. Mm. So that was a very interesting because my dad pa just passed away, so it was a really, I don't know. To it's me, a very, very traumatic, yeah, traumatic. I would put I that know. as my most traumatic event by far. Right. So dad. I was wondering, like, did you, did you ask more why that's the case? Oh yes, we we follow through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, you have to completely re. This is the person you've oriented your life towards. The person you want to make proud. You know, all these reasons why mm -hmm. a father dying can be very traumatic. Um, the second question I have is, uh, so you said you are still con trying to quantifying your data? Yeah. I didn't know what the mean, like. Well, so like answering questions like that, how many, what percentage mm -hmm. of all of our interviewees said that it was most important to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
So in that way, yeah, in that way, you know, sur surveying. And, and Jack has a capacity with his software and coding to, to ask any question we want to ask. We just started with these two qualitative stories, but we'll be doing much more with that. Time to wake up. <laughs> Um, I surmise that there's something kind of therapeutic for the people you're interviewing about engaging in these long, deep, searching questions. Yes. Um, and and, and um, that's part of what is fascinating about them. You, you know, therapists recognize that when you're hearing a narrative from another person, you're getting a construction of reality. Oh, yeah. And in a clinical context, of course, you are most interested in the construction, mm -hmm. not making inferences about you know, what actually happened. Right, right. But your representation of this is, is taking these accounts at face value and as stories of sort of virtue development. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you, if you at all are thinking about looking at your narratives from the point of view of constructions of virtue or constructions of life events leading to virtue. For instance, you raised the question earlier of, you know, would you have spent 20 years caring for um, a disabled sister? So it raises the question for a psychologist of, so what is the construction of oneself, one's responsibility, of what is virtuous, that she makes a different choice? Yes. And whether the interviews give you a purchase on asking those kinds of questions, which is different from taking the narratives as raw data for asking how does virtue develop, or how is virtue right. created, and, and, and more right. asking how does an individual's subjective construction of life experience contribute to virtue for them, but perhaps not for somebody else. It's a different network of questions, and, and I'm interested often in looking at research using narrative in this way, mm -hmm. how very differently different researchers tend to approach the nature of the data that the narrative is presenting them with. So right. I, I present that as a different way of thinking about it. Yes, um, Jack is the expert on this. I mean. Mm -hmm. But certainly, we're, we're both aware they're, we're, they're construct, we do this, we construct a narrative. Then this happened, which resulted in this happening, which you know, may or may not. Well, let me, let me add to that just a little bit. Some of the work on adult autobiographical memory indicates that the life stories we tell about ourselves shift over time. Yes. And not, not just as a function of uh, simple aging, but as a function of changes in our life events that may cause us to have to develop a different autobiographical account to explain the person we are now compared to the person we are years ago. Somebody who goes through a midlife crisis, researchers have found, you know, years later, their story of their past has changed because they are a different person. They're having to explain different things about yes. themselves. In a sense, what you are seeing are these autobiographical accounts at a moment in time you're not able to see they're changing over time, right. but you are in a position to ask, how is this narrative's autobiographical story helping to put in place the interpretation of a set of life events that works for this person? And it strikes me that's a provocative way of thinking about development of virtue. It, it, it is, and I wish I knew more theory about that. And as mm -hmm. I say, Jack is, is the expert on, on that. Yeah. But, um, but I do, it's, it's really interesting because they don't have a chance to think ahead of time. So we'll give them a question like think of a gender event and they're, hmm. You know, I, I'm just shocked that all of them can come up with stuff for everything. If, if, if I were asked these questions, I don't know how I would answer. I, I'm just like, how do they know some, to say something? And I'll just tell you that there's a, there, there are people who do adult attachment interviews who provoke, provoke questions like that and they'll, they'll describe it as surprising the unconscious. Huh. Interesting. No, I'd love to keep learning about this. I, I find it fascinating just personally, but also academically very fascinating. Um, kind of extending uh, that comment, uh, one area could also be looking at gendered constructions of virtue. So what it means to be a virtuous wom woman oh, yeah. versus a virtuous man, and since you have the data for both. Yeah, I do think about that. That I do think about, yes. <laughs> Didn't put it as much in here as, I put a little bit in here. I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, have you, how are you thinking about altering Aristotle's theory 
So are you thinking? <laughs> I know, I need to update them, don't I? <laughs> yes. So I'm wondering, are you thinking there are different levels of eudaimonia, or is that just an inadequate term or idea for today's stresses that people face? Or can you say more about how you're advancing your thought in that area? Wow. Good question. Um, well, even Aristotle isn't clear when you've met the bar for being a virtue. Being, he says you look back at the whole life, so I assume at 60 you're kind of looking back at your whole life. Um, but basically, it's does anyone meet Aristotle's bar? I don't know. So I think I want to think of Aristotle more as an idealization. That's still a nice idea. Wouldn't it be great if we all could flourish and be virtuous and have you know eudaimonia lives? But, uh, but uh, yeah, I think I want to just have people work towards it and not worry about whether they're there. Just try to progress and try, try to do what you can, try to cope. And, and I would, you know, if I were a counselor or something, I would counsel people to try to find more, more joy and pleasure in their lives. This, this Sharon woman, I just felt so terrible for her as I was listening. She just. And she, speaking of reflective, she just wasn't that reflective about herself compared to Lena. She just kind of, she would just kind of say, I had no choice. This is just what I do. I take care of my older sister. She didn't, it was like, she didn't think of her life as a series of choices. It just, things happened to her and that's what had to happen. And she had to shut down in order to do that, probably. Yeah. Stop her wishes and <laughs> well, goals. she did. She was very active in focusing on the family. When she says focusing on the family, she was very active. She she tried to convince her relatives to get tested, although she herself has not been tested. <laughs> but especially if they were going to have children. Um, and she's working with. They, she convinced her family to go to the Mayo Clinic and be part of a research study to help others learn more about this disease. So, so she's still active but much more focused on this particular disease now and her family and how to cope. The uh, definition that you gave for eudaimonia had leisure and luck. Yeah. It seems like a lot the women that you, or at least Sharon, had bad luck. And so yes. there's no way to overcome that. You'll never reach No, so that's why right? I so want... that's where I, I'm wondering if there's multiple levels or some I, there other... There probably are. Yeah. <laughs> you could say this person's this high and this person's this high, I suppose. But once again, it's a roller coaster. What do you do? Average it? I don't know. Oh, I'm dropping the mic here. Nancy has a comment here. I think we're almost. Yeah, right. just a, a very brief question, or two really questions. One is um, if you found in your work uh, significant changes in how people view themselves as virtuous or how you view them as virtuous over the lifespan and. Um, the second question, and I guess this relates to some of the things that we were talking about in connection with Valerie's, you know, point, you know, about, about the projects, Mainheim, how, you know, a virtuous 18-year-old would differ from a virtuous 60-year-old uh, in, in parameters like patience or justice, and how that, you know, how we enact or exercise virtues changes over the lifespan. And secondly, if, if you have thought about whether there are age-appropriate virtues, if the mm -hmm. virtues, you know, there are virtues that a 60-year-old should have that a 20-year-old shouldn't have and vice versa. Great question. Um, I agree with Valerie and her project that the college years appear to be the formative years. So many people do change their life focus and life goals during their college years from what I'm hearing, including with these two women. Um, and that's when they're breaking away from their families. Many change their politics. I was raised a Republican, but then I became a Democrat, you know, uh, those sorts of things. So they're, they're changing quite a bit in their college years and maybe just after that, but, not, but mostly it's college years, if, assuming they went to college. Um, so that's where you see the different virtues starting to show up and different emphasis on different virtues. And I definitely am interested in whether there are different virtues for different life stages. And it seems to me that at 60, you've got different things you're focused on especially if you're retired, Dif it's different. Like trying to answer my own question of do I have any life goals, I'm like, no, I, well, I'm full professor, that was one of my goals. I'm published, that was one of my goals. Do I have any goals left? <laughs> <laughs> you 
that because I was one of, this was what worries me about people with goals because like Tiger Woods or something, my goal is to win this, all these things and then if you don't, if you're incapacitated or you do it and you're done now with your athletic career, what are you doing? So it's been good for even my thinking about what are, what are the, my virtues at this later stage in my life where I don't care if I'm ever published again. <laughs> yeah. Any last question? Hi, so this is just a general question that I can't answer, but maybe you have some thought of, uh, about it. In narrative, I guess it's, it's uh, designed such that you've got an actor who encounters some sort of trouble and then responds more or less well to that, that trouble. Mm -hmm. And so it almost seems as though this kind of ro roller coaster quality that you're um, so saying is characteristic of life stories is built into like what it means to tell a story, a, a, a set of stories about, about your life. Right. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, I think that's a sort of general problem for the life narrative approach, but what your thoughts are based on the sort of the, the kinds of whole life accounts you had, are there times where people, um, I guess, try to sort of sidestep that quality maybe? Like even some of the examples you're giving, there might be things that persist as, as themes or something that don't really have this up and down quality. There's something that you've, that, that makes sense to you for, for your life, taking care of your sister. I mean, the day-to-day -day quality of that is not really, um, it's not really a narrative so much. It's just a state of, of being, something like that. That's why she, yeah, Sharon didn't, I mean, and this once again is Jack's thing about self-actualization over a lifetime. I, I don't know as much as I wish you were here, but um, he viewed Sharon as not, not progressing mm -hmm. and not viewing herself as progressing. Right. She was stuck. Her highlight of her life was college. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Lena, she, she's much more educated and much more together in my opinion, but she, she definitely has trajectory where she feels like she's improved mm -hmm. and including even in how to think about her marriage. She's thinking deeply about that now and trying to figure out how to solve. I mean, so she feels like she's really done a lot with work life. She's done a lot. She raised two great kids, still trying to think through her marriage. Um, I think most people, their vices and virtues have stayed with them throughout their lives, mm -hmm. according to them. Well, you know, early childhood or late childhood on. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.